these out. Raise your hand and Forrest will hand out the note sheet. Understanding our local assembly, we want to pick it up on letter D tonight, and I invite you to please turn in your Bible to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, chapter 1. There's only one chapter. If you have a Bible where your pages stick together, you may have a hard time finding it. I do everything I can to keep you from having pages that stick together in your Bible. A pastor once told me when I was in high school, when you read the same Bible long enough, it gets buttons in it. All you have to do is think, and your Bible turns right to that verse. I'm working on that. Jude, the book of Jude. In understanding our local assembly, we certainly do have distinctives at Crossroads Bible Church. To begin with, we only fly one flag here, and that's the name, the testimony, the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's who we're all about, is Jesus Christ. We preach him crucified, that he died and he rose again. He ascended to where he is right now at the right hand of the Father, Jesus Christ, God, who is our Savior, who is even coming again. And so he's the head of our church. That's a fundamental conviction of this local assembly. And we are also dispensational. That means we interpret the scriptures literally in the normal, grammatical, historical sense. And we understand, of course, that the Bible teaches that Israel and the church are two different entry entities. Israel is the nation that God brought into existence through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God gave tremendous promises, unconditional promises to Abraham. And then, under the leadership of Moses, he brought his people out of Egypt to Mount Sinai, and he entered into a covenant relationship with them under the law. Through the history of the nation of Israel, God made promises that there would one day be a new covenant that he would enter into his, with his people. He has not yet entered into that covenant with his people because that new covenant has been provided for in the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the nation of Israel, having rejected Jesus Christ as her Messiah, has excluded themselves from that new covenant. But one day, God's going to bring the nation of Israel back through a spirit of grace, he's going to bring the people to mourn for Jesus Christ, the Savior that they crucified. One day they'll repent. That hasn't happened yet. But right now, God has brought into existence the church, the body of Christ, a spiritual people. That is, whether you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, rich, poor. You can be a king. You can be a slave. It doesn't matter. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you trust in him. You become a child of God. You are redeemed. You are justified. You are regenerated. You are a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. The church, the body of Christ. Two different entities with two different plans, two different goals, two different ends that God has. We are dispensational because we recognize that that's the, what the Word of God teaches when you take it literally. We want tonight to talk about having a fundamental stand on doctrine. A fundamental stand upon doctrine. What do we mean by that? Did you find the book of Jude? If you did, I'd like to draw your attention to verse 3. Jude verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That is the truth, the body of doctrine that was once for all given to the saints. Why? Verse 4, Jude writes, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God, the grace of our God, into lewdness, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There are those who claim to be Christians, and yet they deny basic truths about God's word. Now this became very front and center in the United States of America in the mid-1800s. 
In the mid-1800s, the impact of three philosophies that came to the shores of America through preachers who had studied, some in Germany, some in France, some in England, some right here at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and they had embraced these philosophies that elevated logic and human reasoning up and above and over against the word of God. This all came out of the Enlightenment. And uh, it had a devastating impact in the pulpits of the churches of America. No longer was the gospel what was being preached, but there was a scientific understanding and look at things whereby we were looking from, for answers from science, whether it was archaeology or whether it was biology or whether it was chemistry. We were looking for answers from science. Now, there's a lot to be learned and there's a lot of good that can come from all those areas of science. But the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who takes God's word seriously understands that God's the creator of this whole universe. And so we dare not embrace some kind of philosophies in evolution. The evolution is one of the things that came out of this search for science in the 1800s, the belief that man evolved over long ages and periods of time, that as a random processes of chance and happenstance, here we are. When Genesis said, in the beginning, God created. Man is the product of the creative act of God to marvelously design and bring us into existence. In the 1800s, that began to be doubted by people who claimed to be Christian. But that's not the only thing they denoted, like, denied and doubted. Like Jude tells us here, they began to deny that the Bible was the word of God. Well, they said it was a special book. It was a wonderful book. But it wasn't a divine book. Some people began to get critical about the miracles in the Bible. Well, we're not so sure because we can't prove miracles in the scientific lab. Uh, they began to deny things like the deity of Jesus Christ, just as the writers of the New Testament said they would. Jesus was a good man. He lived a good life. We should model the life of Jesus Christ, but his blood does not pay for our sins. They began to deny the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Well, I want to tell you that some other things were going on in America in addition to these philosophies of men. I'm going to read to you, I wrote a little bit of a synopsis, our nation's history as colonies not only experienced the development of disbelief in the word of God and the truths that were once for all delivered to the saint, also, our nation and its history was marked by three great outpourings of God's blessing upon this land, the United States of America. The first great outpouring of God's blessing came in the 1720s to the 1760s. That's about 40 years, four decades, under the ministry and teaching of men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and it was known as the first great awakening. During this time, Many people in the early colonies came to hear the evangelistic preaching of George Whitfield. He spoke on the commons of the cities. He spoke in the open fields out in the country in these early countries, and many people trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior and were born again. A second great awakening took place from the 1790s to the early 1840s. It got started here in New England, and it saw the rise of the camp meeting in western the United States. It was a time of renewed interest in religion, and it was a growth in church tendencies and many Protestant denominations. In the 1800s, in 1857, the Third Great Awakening, also known as the Prayer Meeting Revival, began in New York City. This revival only lasted for two years, but had a profound and dramatic impact on this young and growing nation. It was out of the Prayer Meeting Revival that the Lord touched the hearts of men who would become leaders of a movement to teach the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. In 1875, seven men gathered together in Chicago for private Bible study meetings. 
and this was to be the beginning of a very great movement in America. In 1876, these same men gathered again for Bible study. This time they met in Swampscott, Massachusetts. The first five days of their gathering on July 19th through the 23rd, these men met in a parlor and then also out under the shade of a tree in the yard of that home. But then interest in their Bible study began to grow. And for the last three days of their Bible studies, from July 24th through July 26th, they were asked to move their meetings into the chapel of the local congregational church so that others could come and join them for their Bible study. Two of the men who attended these meetings, James H. Brooks and A.J. Gordon, wrote periodicals and gave accounts of the meetings and the teaching from these Bible studies and the periodicals that they wrote. These periodicals were widely read and increased interest among believers in these meetings, and there was a thirst for Bible study. People wanted to study the Bible. As the meetings were held each year in different locations, the attendance began to grow. And in 1883, the conference was held at Niagara Lake, Ontario for the very first time and was continued, it, it continued to be held at this location from 1883 through 1897, 14 years in a row. The Bible topics that were read and taught at the earliest meetings were the second coming of Jesus Christ, the deity of Jesus Christ, and the personality of the Holy Spirit. In addition, there was much instruction on all the doctrine which was under attack by modernism. Modernism was the belief that you could be a Christian and yet deny these basic doctrines. The Bible's not the divine word of God. It's just a book written by men for men filled with good truth. Those were modernists, people who denied that Jesus was God who became flesh. They just said he was a good man who lived a good life, teaching many good things, and we ought to do the good things that he taught us to do. This was called the social gospel, and it was permeating America at the expense of the gospel of salvation, the truth that Christ died for our sins and shed his precious blood to pay for our sins. That was no longer believed by those who were modernists. Well, the Bible conference also had a strong theme on personal separation to God from sin, from self, and from the world. The Niagara Bible Conferences had a very important impact on the beginnings of the movement known as fundamentalism in America. It grew out of a thirst to study the Bible among some pastors that grew into a thirst of people who said, we want to come and we want to be in on the Bible studies too, that grew into a Bible conference movement that lasted 14 years. And it gave birth to the movement known as fundamentalism. But I want to tell you, we're talking about the years of 1897 in 1901. I wasn't here yet. This is a long time ago. But it has a direct impact on why we are the kind of assembly that we are today. In the 1970s, this movement of fundamentalism was beginning to be given a bad name Fundamentalists were called legalists. They were called pharisaical. They were called those who did not know or show the love of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to grant you that sadly there probably were some fundamentalists who were guilty of all those things. But that's not what fundamentalism is. Let me read to you a quote from Dr. Lehman Strauss. Bible teacher Dr. Lehman Strauss defined the biblical movement of fundamentalists as a fundamentalist is one who, quote, believes in the basic fundamental doctrines of historic Christianity as found in the Bible, the word of God, end of quote. That's what a fundamentalist is. At least that's what we mean when we say a fundamentalist. One of those who continues in a very rich heritage of people who believe the word of God and we're willing to hold the truth of the word of God near, and we're not going to let it go. That's what we mean by a fundamentalist. 
we have a very rich heritage here in America. I want to tell you as I talk to people, as they come and go, I have a hard time finding anybody who wants to be known as a fundamentalist. As a matter of fact, when I talk to most guys coming out of college, not all, but when I talk to most guys who are coming out of college, whether they've trained to be a pastor or whether they've trained to be a missionary, I say, are you, would you consider yourself a fundamentalist? They look at me and they stand, no, I'm not a fundamentalist. It breaks my heart. But we've lost a sense of what it means to be a fundamentalist. And we've given in to new evangelicals who have redefined what fundamentalism is. And it's important for me, as I express to you the distinctive of our assembly, Crossroads Bible Church, that we are without apology a fundamentalist church. We're not funny mentalists. That's one of the words that was thrown at fundamentalists. They were called funny mentalists in the 1950s and the 1960s, meaning they had some weird, deranged way of thinking. You know what was the weird, deranged way of thinking? They were willing to stand on the truth of the Word of God and separate themselves from doctrinal error, heresy, and apostasy to remain pure in their testimony for Jesus Christ. A fundamentalist is very serious that God is holy. And that has a direct impact on the way we live because God says, be ye holy for I am holy. I think that's still in 1 Peter chapter 1. I think it's still there. And that's what we mean. What Dr. Lehman Strauss says is what we mean. Doc, uh, Richard DeHaan affirms fundamentalism is a position that holds the historic fundamentals of the Christian faith. Basic truths that cannot be compromised. Regrettably, the term fundamentalism, originally intended as a purely theological indicator, has in some quarters come to be considered a cultural one as well. That's not what we mean. We don't mean culturally a fundamentalist. We mean somebody who holds to the truths of the word of God. And I did ask you to get out your orange sheet because that's where we're going because I've listed there for you 10, just 10. It's not a comprehensive list but it's 10 major doctrines that are the f doctrines that were the once for all delivered to the saints. We'll see that in just a moment. But that's what we mean by fundamentalists. In 1901, a man named Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, C.I. Schofield, was invited to speak at the Sea Cliff Bible Conference on Long Island, New York, where he met with a man named Arno Gabeline and spoke of a project which he had been contemplating, a study Bible. In 1909, C.I. Schofield, along with the help of other contributors, uh, completed the Schofield Study Bible. This new study Bible in 1909, <laughs> this new study Bible had copious notes and a ref Bible reference system that were premillennial and dispensational in their approach to biblical interpretation, and it found widespread acceptance and use. The Bible was printed by Oxford University Press, and in January of 1909, they printed two million copies in the first two years. This work, which took nine years of dedicated study, writing and editing, was completely underwritten by Christian businessmen, meaning Christians paid the price of it completely, the work that the men did on that study Bible. Well, uh, th these things are just to give you a little sense of a rich heritage of history we have in America, and sadly, to know that it's been so disdained and is currently being rejected is not to our own good. The first fundamental doctrine, I'm looking on your orange sheet now, the first fundamental doctrine that we hold is the absolute accuracy and authority of God's word. The absolute accuracy and authority of God's word. We saw 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 this morning, where the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and says, all scripture is given by inspiration. How much scripture? All scripture is given by inspiration. The word inspiration is theopneustos. It means it is spirit-breathed. 
the writings of these chosen men, whether it was the Old Testament prophets or the New Testament apostles, is God-breathed. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus said the scriptures cannot be broken. And we believe that what God said to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate in it day and night. God told Joshua, therein you will make your way prosperous. You will have success. Why? By knowing, reading, studying, and meditate on the word of God. This book is the only book that God has written, Genesis to Revelation, and we believe it is a divine book. It is God-breathed. That means it's accurate. That means it's authoritative, meaning it's not about what I say, it's what has God said. That's number one. That's the first fundamental in the 1800s that was completely left out. It's interesting, but you can hear testimonies of different ones. They'd be sitting in a church, and one week they'd hear a nice message from the Gospel of Matthew, sounded wonderful, and then the next week they'd hear a portion of Shakespeare presented. And, and they'd be like, wait a minute, what was that? Because to the modernist, the Bible was just a writing of these men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They didn't see it as a divinely inspired work of God using human men to write it, God's word. They just saw it as a work of men. So we can consider other works of men. Well, this has only grown and got worse today. I was recently asked to examine an assembly where someone's children were going because they were concerned about where they were going. So I just clicked today. You can just click in. You can do this with our church too. You can just click in and you can watch a podcast of a recent message. And, and in a recent message, the, the pastor had a, a clear plastic lectern. Nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Clear plastic lectern. But the Bible was on a shelf underneath it. It was down here. And he had a book that someone had written. And, and for about 30 minutes, he talked about this book that someone had written. It had lots of good things. He was saying lots of good things. But then all of a sudden, for one moment, he reached down and he pulled out a Bible. I was shocked. He opened it up and he read a verse and he promptly closed it and put the Bible back down on the shelf. And I thought, what kind of a message is that sending to the people? The book... God's word was not the authority, it was just a reference book in that message. That's all it was. Dear brother and sister Christ, God's word is not a reference book. This is God's holy word, thus saith the Lord. The, we are all gathered together in God's presence to hear what the Lord has to say. Amen? Amen. We're fundamentalists. We believe that. And that's what we mean by that. That's what we mean. It's not that we're cantankerous. It's not that we're legalistic. I pray that we show the love of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest command he's given us. Show, I want you to show love to one another as I have loved you, John 13, 33, and 34, and 35. Yeah, but that's what we mean. And so we take God's word seriously. You know, the, the pulpit came out of the Reformation. You know that, don't you? The pulpit was given to us by the reformers. John Calvin, Martin Luther, they, they designed a, a sanctuary that didn't have an altar in the front and center. It had a pulpit. And the reason for the pulpit was for the Bible. And the man who's up on the pulpit is standing behind the book and he's to be giving out what the book says. That's what the Reformation gave us. I pray that we still recognize and remember that. That's a blessing. That's a blessing to put God's word as the authority. We're here to, we want to know what God has said. Number one is the absolute accuracy, the absolute authority of the word of God. Let me just, because of our time, only cover number two. We'll pick up on these in the coming weeks. I really wanted to remind you of the history of fundamentalism. Because God has given us a rich heritage of men who took God seriously. And I want to tell you, God blessed those men. And God blessed those people because they loved him and they loved his word. And his blessing was upon that. And that'll be the same today, you know. God's blessing will be on each and every one who honors him. If you honor the Lord, 
He'll bless you for it. But if we set God and His Word aside, if we set the Holy Spirit of God aside, don't think that the blessing of God will be there. You may have all kinds of things that you can substitute, pragmatism and the ideas of men, and they may work and they bring, may bring a crowd, but I want to tell you, I don't want a crowd. I want the presence of God. Because that's what we're here to seek, the presence of God. Number two, the second one, is the virgin birth and the deity of Jesus Christ. The virgin birth and the deity of Jesus Christ. Let me just give you one reference, Luke chapter 1, verses 34 and 35. We believe that Jesus Christ was born to the virgin Mary. That is, Mary had never had any relations with a man. She was betrothed to Joseph, her husband, but the wedding ceremony had not yet taken place, and they had never come together as a husband and wife, and yet she was found with child. Mary was told that this was going to happen in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. That's when the angel Gabriel came to uh, Mary to tell her about the plan of God. Notice in verse 27, uh, I'll read verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a what? A virgin. The word of God is very clear. Betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. Notice, please, in verses 34 and 35. After the angel Gabriel is telling Mary that she's going to have a baby and that this baby is going to be called the son of the highest and he's going to be on the throne of his father David, ruling and reigning over the kingdom uh, in Israel, Mary asks a very important question. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not what? I don't know a man. No. Now, can you prove that she was a virgin? Not without the Bible, you can't. Do you understand why the Word of God, believing it's God's Word, is number one? Believing and understanding the Word of God is what God has said is the foundation of these doctrines. And these doctrines are by faith. You don't prove them by science and laboratory. You understand this is what God has said. And God's very clear about it. By the way, God answers her question. Verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Not only was he virgin born, but this was God who became flesh. All right, we'll pick it up here next time that we gather together and have an opportunity. It won't be next week. Next week, we're looking forward to having some missionaries with us, missionary appointees to Poland. I hope you'll come. I'm looking forward to hearing all about how God is preparing them to take the gospel to Poland. Let's look to God in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your word, and we thank you for the rich heritage of those who believe and have believed in Jesus Christ. Many of them have now gone home to glory. And here we are. We thank you, Father, for the rich heritage of faith in you and your word. And I pray that we will stand, and having done all, that we will stand upon the truth that you have given to us, that we will hold fast and continue in the things that you have given to us, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Father, that your name and your testimony might be vibrant for your glory. And we give our thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen.